thank you so much for joining us to this new uh, breakout session on Chagas disease in the core NTD. Thanks uh, very much always to the core NTD organizers that opened this house for the Chagas community. And thanks also to our regular members and contributing members and the founding members uh, especially Mundo Sano, who promote the presence of Chagas Coalition in the core NTD, uh, Fundación Seades, Baylor College, uh, DNDI, and Anes Global, and all the members that, uh, and, and friends and allies that are here in, in this session one year more. We hope next year we can do it in person because these uh, meetings are very special when we, we are in, in, and in an in person uh, version. So this year we have uh, focusing on one of the operational research uh, biggest challenge that is the diagnosis and how this can strengthen the, the health system. Health systems very weak, very limited, especially after a dramatic and, and uh, COVID-19 pandemic that uh, put uh, a high pressure to the health systems uh, in order to deal with all health priorities and has been really like Juan Luis Guerra said, uh, very hard, like crossing the Ni Niagara Falls by biking. So um, still today, the situation is, is very bad, but for the NTDs, we have a decade uh, with crucial advances and progress that we can review some way in this, in this session. It is an honor, a, pl a, a pleasure and a luxury to have um, uh, special moderators that uh, is going to introduce this session. We have two uh, special moderators uh, this year. One of them is uh, Dr. Eva Clark, uh, assistant professor of medicine specializing in infectious diseases and pediatrics specialized in tropical medicines uh, of the Baylor College and also in Texas in the Center of Development of the Vaccine in the Texas Children's Hospital. Her research interests include the epidemiologic, immunologic, and clinical consequences of tropical infectious disease on the development of chronic disease in underserved communities. She is also co-leader of the U.S. Chagas Disease Providers Network and the Associate Director of Medical Education at the Baylor College. Also, we have uh, Luis Gerardo Castellanos, uh, physician trained in Guatemala in the University of San Carlos, and he earned an MPH from the University of Puerto Rico and a PhD in epidemiology from the University of South Carolina. Since 1997, uh, Dr. Castellanos joined the Pan, Pan American Health Organization, advising countries of Latin America mainly in the prevention and control of outbreaks, and lately, on the prevention, control, and elimination of priority infectious disease. Since 2011, Dr. Castellanos serves in PAHO headquarters as a senior advisor uh, and unit chief of the neglected tropical and vector-borne disease. So I let the word to these uh, two moderators adverting that they have a call to as many of our attendees. So thank you so much, because as you know, this kind of task take a lot of time. Uh, it's part of your of, of your time extra of your extra time of work. So thank you so much both for helping us to moderate this session. I let you the word, Eva. Thank you so much. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. And thank or for me anyway, good morning. Um, thank you all for that uh, for coming to our session, um, our quarantine session on Chagas disease. And thank you so much, Javier, for that kind introduction. Um, one thing I wanted to note before introducing our first speaker um, is that I want everyone to know that the four speakers you're about to hear, um, well, three of the four speakers are presenting via recorded video. Um, however, after the conclusion of the four talks, uh, they will be present live to answer questions. All right, so I have the great pleasure of introducing our first speaker to you, Dr. Jeffrey Whitman. Uh, Dr. Whitman is an assistant professor at the University of California, San Francisco in the Department of Laboratory Medicine. He serves as the Director of Clinical Microbiology at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and along with me is co-leader of the United States Chagas Providers Network. He is an accomplished investigator interested in improving the serologic diagnosis of Chagas disease 
and he participated in the uh, recently published U.S. recommendations for screening and diagnosis of Chagas disease. He will speak to us today on the current diagnosis guidelines versus new alternatives in the pipeline. Uh, let's start his presentation. Hi, everyone. Everyone, I'm excited to be talking to you all today about Chagas disease laboratory testing. Due to the brief time that we have, we'll mainly be focusing on serology testing and the guidance about uh, multi-step algorithms. Um, and at the end, I'd like to, to talk about ways that we can improve or make our algorithmic testing more efficient and effective. I'd also like to say as a U.S. Uh, healthcare provider, um, a, a lot of commentary will also be on some of the uh, areas we have for improvement in the U.S as well as limitations for Chagas disease screening. Just as a note, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Jumping right in, um, I'd like to talk about the scenarios for clinical testing or screening of Chagas disease. Now this assumes you know a little bit about the life cycle of T. cruzi infection, having both an acute and chronic phase, with the chronic phase being assumed lifelong in the absence of treatment. Uh, now for the acute phase of disease, we are trying to detect the active and prolific replication of the parasite, um, which is happening intracellularly, then bursting out into its extracellular form and swimming around in the peripheral blood, looking for other cells to infect. So to do this, we want to use direct detection methods, which include molecular testing by PCR and light microscopy. However, the indications for this testing are really the minority of cases. The majority of cases will be looking for T. cruzi in the chronic phase of disease uh, based on epidemiological risk factors related to vector exposure or congenital transmission. Um, so in this phase, the parasite is predominantly sequestered in its intracellular form inside the tissues, uh, mainly in the heart and the gut. Um, so the most sensitive detection methods is actually going to be assessing the host antibody response to the parasite, otherwise known as serology testing. Due to the overall low prevalence of disease in most clinical populations and the fact that there are no perfect tests, the current recommendations by the Pan American Health Organization are to use multiple serological assays to confirm a diagnosis. So to illustrate this below, we can see in figure A, if you're using two separate tests with distinct antigens and they're both positive, then you have ruled in disease. And conversely, if both assays are negative, uh, you have ruled out disease. However, as we see in figure B here, uh, if the two tests are discordant, meaning one is positive and one is negative, uh, we will need a tiebreaker to either confirm or rule out disease. Given the requirements of this algorithm, I think it is important to discuss the different types of immunoassay tests that can be used to confirm a diagnosis. I would also like to preface that there are multiple assays available on the international market that are not available in the U.S. So I'd like to specifically mention the availability of each of these options in the U.S. as a point of advocacy. First here on the left, we have uh, the chemiluminescent microparticle assay or CMIA. These instruments are only made for clinical testing with proprietary platforms and reagents. So this is not a research assay that you can develop or modify. But as such, they are made to be high throughput and require minimal labor. So you just load the sample, walk away, and you'll get an answer. Unfortunately, no CMIA tests are FDA cleared in the US, but assays are available on the international market made by Abbott, Diasorin, Roche, and Siemens. The lack, of the lack of availability in the US, however, greatly limits screening capacity at the level of the individual hospital and clinical laboratory making testing really only available at commercial reference laboratories. Um, moving on to the second assay we have here, this is the enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay or ELISA. These tests are still high throughput in the sense that they are run on 96 well plates where each well would be a sample, but they can be labor intensive and require multiple pipetting and incubation steps over the course of a couple hours. In the US, we have three assays that are cleared for testing, but only two are commercially available. Next, we have the immunochromatographic lateral flow assays. 
often abbreviated as ICTs or LFAs. These tests are the lowest throughput in that you get one test per sample, but their major benefit is their ease of use. Um, they are well suited for point of care testing in the clinic or for field testing. And additionally, they are also useful in the laboratory when you only need to test a few samples and you don't want to set up a whole ELISA. We currently have one uh, FDA cleared assay. However, it is not commercially available. Lastly, we have an immunoblot that was largely developed by Brazilian researchers called the Tripomastigo Excreted Secreted Antigen Immunoblot or TESA-blot for short. This test has low throughput like the ICT and is labor intensive to prepare the antigens from parasite culture. But the major benefit it is, is that it is highly sensitive and specific and as such has often been adopted as a confirmatory test. Here in the US, the CDC has adopted it and developed it as a laboratory developed test, but it is only available through this lab um, because it is not scalable to prepare these antigens um, in non-specialized clinical laboratories. Now that we have gone through both the algorithm and types of assays that can be used for serological testing, I would like to discuss two ideas where algorithmic testing can be improved or made more efficient. The first is automated ELISA testing platforms, and the second is the development of recombinant antigen immunoblots. Automated ELISA testing platforms have the ability to run at least two ELISA simultaneously and can be programmed for almost any assay. You just load the ELISA plates, as seen here by the, the red arrows, load your samples and controls and reagents, as seen by the blue arrows, and hit start. These platforms greatly expedite confirmatory diagnosis at initial testing and also allow for rapid identification of discordant samples that will need reflexive testing. In regard to tiebreaker testing, the development of recombinant antigen immunoblots have been a solution for increased specificity of an assay without the loss of sensitivity. Uh, this technology is used for other infectious disease confirmatory testing such as HIV, as seen here uh, in this image of the BioRed HIV-12 confirmatory assay. Now, the development of recombinant antigen immunoblots for confirmatory testing would greatly decrease the labor and quality control of cultured parasite antigen preparation that's used in the TESA blot. Um, and it, it would also make the confirmatory testing algorithms more widely available to hospital and reference laboratories. Um, I would like to note that we already have one recombinant immunoblot developed by Abbott, but currently it is only cleared by the FDA for blood donor testing and has not been evaluated uh, in clinical populations for confirmatory testing. But I think it is uh, an area where that would be worth exploring. I'd like to thank you all for your attention and also acknowledge the core NTD organizers and moderators, Javier Sancho and Dr. Ava Clark, as well as my mentor at UCSF, Dr. Karen Byrne. All right, thank you so much um, for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Whitman. Um, now I would like to mention um, just a couple other housekeeping points. Um, we, after the fourth presentation, um, we are gonna have a very short interval for questions. Um, if you would like to ask a question at that point, um, please select the raise your hand icon in reactions. Um, also, if you have any comments, um, please feel free to share them in the chat. All right, now I will hand over to my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Castellanos, to introduce our second speaker. Thank you, Eva, and, and good morning, everyone. I, my apologies in advance for, for my low uh, tone of voice, but um, I'm going through this bad cold. So um, our second speaker is a very well-known uh, physician from Spain. She's a very good friend of many of ours. And uh, she's currently, she just joined um, the DNDI uh, institution in 2022 as the head of the Chagas Disease Action and Initiative, Maria Jesus Piñazo is her name. And uh, since 2007, 
She has been working as a medical doctor from Spain and moving between uh, Barcelona and uh, Bolivia. She earned uh, a PhD degree in internal medicine and she received uh, cum laude uh, recognition and also uh, a prestigious uh, uh, extraordinary uh, award as a doctorate in 2017. She, ever since she's been uh, working in the International Health Service of the uh, Clinic Hospital in Barcelona, mainly dedicated to tropical and uh, international um, dis diseases, uh, including Chagas. She's also uh, teaching at the Masters of International Health uh, program, and uh, she's been co-coordinating the protocol for the detection and diagnosis of Chagas disease in pregnant women. Uh, and babies. Uh, she uh, <clears throat> also um, is the technical coordinator of the platform on comprehensive care for the patients of Chagas in Bolivia. And in 2011, she joined the, uh, the network for uh, new tools for diagnosis and assessment of Chagas patients uh, uh, called the International Network. And in 2019, she became the coordinator of such a prestigious uh, network. So with that, I would uh, love to have uh, Dr. Pinasso uh, video. And, and just to remind everyone that likely she'll be uh, in person to answer some questions at the end of this presentation. Go ahead, please. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. My name is Maria Jesus Pinazo. I'm the head of Chagas program at DNDI, Drugs for Neurotic Diseases Initiative. And I would like to thank you very much to Corin TV organizers and the Chagas Global Coalition Coordination to invite us to share our experience in Guatemala and Colombia uh, with you in order to answer the research question of the breaking session today. And uh, with, that, with that purpose, I would I would like to first of all to, to, to share with you what are DNDI's objectives and story briefly. We are focused on neglected patients and on developing uh, new medicines and new formulations of former drugs uh, for neglected tropical diseases and that these people are at risk. Um, we do that also strengthening capacities in a sustainable way. In almost 25 years since our creation, 18 additional treatments for forgotten patients has been developed and to 2028 we aim to increase this number with five to seven new treatments from the new chemical entities to the adoption of, of these drugs. So we do that through uh, the three pillars of our mission that is innovation for uh, safe lives, uh, to foster inclusive and sustainable solutions and advocate for change. And what about Chagas disease? As you know, there are today um, more than 75 people at risk of, of having the infection and with the infection already six to seven million people. And among them, 30% with cardiological and cardiological damage, about around 40% with cardiological and or digestive damage. So while new treatments are ready to be used, we have to take care of people because there is a situation in which among all these people, only 10% are diagnosed and less than 1% are treated. So our goal to 2028 is to contribute to eliminate uh, Chagas as a public health problem uh, through the development of, of a safer and shorter treatment with benzimidazole to make progress towards a entirely new drug for Chagas and to reduce mother-to-child transmission and accelerate rollout of, rollout of test and treat strategies. This is our complete, just a, a picture of our complete portfolio from drug, drug discovery to adoption. At the end of the clinical research uh, program, we are at that moment uh, moving forward with phase three study with shorter regimes of benzimidazole together with Mundo Sano and Elia Phoenix, and also moving forward with a new chemical entity that is at that moment in phase one and in, in a few years in phase 2A and with, uh, with a new drug uh, that, is, uh, that belongs to Novartis in order to, to try to move forward with a proof of concept of, of it in, in Latin America. 
On the other hand, we are also uh, evaluating the performance of uh, rapid diagnostic tests in, in laboratory and in the field in Colombia and in Guatemala, and transversally including the research and development of biomarkers to assess parasitological response, parasitological cure or, or decrease after treatment, and prognosis biomarkers to assess a patient's potential for disease progression. In this scenario, and if, even if we have the perfect drug, we, we need to know if uh, it, this perfect drug will reach uh, uh, patients in need and uh, if, if it is on time, if we are late. So there are also barriers on access that should be taken in account if we want to promote the, the, the delivery of the drug we have the drug in, in our hands to the hands of people that are that are needed at that moment so for that in terms of uh, the healthcare of, of Chagas diseases it is it, it is a need to evaluate a structural systemic clinical and psychological barriers that we well, that we found when we when we want to to fulfill the complete uh, way uh, in order to have patients already treated for that, the NDA have developed the diagnosis, design, deliver, and demonstrate impact model. The 4D model that I'm going to show you with a case with a case study in Colombia and in Guatemala. Colombia was in a situation uh, epidemiological, epidemiologically very, very hard in terms of uh, ticlosa infection burden, with less of one percent of people test uh, or treated, and uh, with more than 100 thousand people living with Chagas related heart disease. After the, the, the evaluation of the situation, there was a design of roadmap to take care of this patient to and to treat uh, to test and treat them the, in, in a decentralized way. So what we did uh, from 2015, first we identified the barriers I, I told you about then a new algorithm for Chagas diagnosis was created together with the Ministry of Health and, and local and local health institutions devoted to, 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 to treat Chagas and to manage Chagas disease. Then following this uh, algorithm, uh, there were the implementation of pilots, pilot to test and treat people in five municipalities from four departments in, in Colombia. And then uh, recently we have been Two years ago, before pandemics, uh, the impact was assessed with a very good result. There are a dramatic increase of diagnosis, of access to diagnose the people diagnosed, as you, as you can realize, the decrease of a time for diagnose, a decrease of time since the, the diagnosis was effective to the starting uh, of, of a treatment regime. Um, a, a, a dramatic decrease of the cost of uh, that that uh, that means uh, th that means uh, a timely treatment to and not to diagnose and treat patient uh, allowing in this second case uh, the the appearance of of complications and um, for sure an an increased coverage uh, due to that. What are the perspectives? To, to, to expand to expand the model to other uh, high endemic uh, departments of the country uh, to to continue with the with the purpose of the simplification of this test and treat uh, test and treat process through the validation of rapid rapid diagnostic test algorithm in in, in this uh, in these uh, municipalities and in the country and if we have good results of our our uh, clinical trial with shorter regimes of benidazole also to introduce a shorter regimen of treatment in this algorithm and for sure to support EDMI plus uh, program uh, in imp uh, implementation in our intervention areas something similar has been done or is being done uh, indeed in, in guatemala in jutiapa and jalapa departments so we started from the field diagnosis on the on the situation a seminar on barriers on these access barriers i mentioned before then development together with the with the chagas program and, and the ministry of health and the, the the academia linked to our projects the usac the university of san carlos 
then uh, train uh, training activities and um, um, in 2019 just before the uh, the pandemics but I have to say that activities wasn't stopped during pandemics. Chagas Healthcare Center in Comapa started diagnosing, uh, diagnosing and treating patients. And we are moving forward, forward with a new center in Jalapa with a similar, with a similar uh, structure of, of intervention. We have had in these two years, just two years, uh, very good results, increasing the numbers of people, as you can realize, uh, people diagnosed, treated, and above all, with a very good coverage of a woman at fertile age. As you know, the timely diagnosis of woman uh, and treatment of, of woman at fertile age prevent a uh, transmit infection transmission following a mother to child way. So, Are you still there? Maria Jesus? And we are moving forward forward with a new center in Jalapa with a similar with a similar uh, structure of, of intervention. We have had in these two years, just two years, uh, very good results, increasing the numbers of people, as you can realize, uh, people diagnosed, treated, and above all, with a very good coverage of a woman at fertile age. As you know. The timely diagnosis of woman uh, and treatment of, of woman at fertile age prevent uh, transmit infection transmission following the mother to child way. So, what are the key learning points and take home messages? There are critical elements as they, uh, to, to move forward with this integrated vision of uh, research and development and access programs, activities and actions and that there are political commitment and work together with local authorities to build on a collaborative, uh, the collaborative design and include uh, all activities as a part of a routine of healthcare and at, at a country level. Increasing access to testing may reveal um, new bottlenecks. Uh, still, the simplification of treatment is an urgent need. It is important to promote the use, uh, at the, first the validation and then the use of this rapid diagnosis test and to scale up uh, the, the actions if, if they work as, as, as it is the proposal for the future. So I, I hope it has been useful to answer the question we had in this, uh, in this breaking session. And I remain listening to, to comments, uh, questions, and always uh, ready to, to collaborate with, with all the community. Thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, for that excellent presentation, uh, Maria Jesus. I, I think Eva, we're, we're having these uh, presenters with an outstanding use of the time, which is not very common, so we're very lucky. Um, I, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, we, we are very uh, grateful, grateful for all of the efforts that uh, researchers and institutions are doing to improve capacity and, and innovation for diagnosis and treatment uh, with some of the concerns in public health that that brings, I think is overall great news. So with that, Eva, I will pass the microphone to you again to introduce our third um, speaker. Thank you, Luis Gerardo. Um, now I am pleased to introduce um, our third speaker, Dr. Alejandro Schiemann. Dr. Schiemann is the director of the Chagas Disease Molecular Biology Laboratory at the Research Institute in Genetic Engineering and Molecular Biology at Argentina's National Council of Scientific and Technical Investigations, better known as CONICET. 
Among his many distinctions, he has worked as an expert consultant for organizations such as FINE, DNDI, and the WHO, and currently is a member of the WHO's technical group on the prevention and control of trypanosoma cruzi congenital infections. Today, he will be speaking to us live about how to improve mother-to-child transmission control through scaling up of early diagnosis. Dr. Sheeman, I give you the floor. Okay, thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> you must let me use the video. Okay, thank you for the invitation to this presentation. I'm going to talk about how to improve control of mother to child transmission of trypanosoma cruzi infection to screen up of early diagnosis. Novel diagnostic tools suitable for point of care detection of congenital child disease are urgently needed. Early detection of congenital transmission of trypanosoma cruzi is essential taking into account that antiparasitic treatment within the first year of life of a child born to a seropositive mother is extremely effective and allows accurate demonstration of cure. Following the initiative for elimination of mother to child transmission of different infections such as HIV, syphilis, hepatitis B and child disease, at least in Argentina, a recent modification of the current algorithm for diagnosis of congenital child disease has been the inclusion of real-time PCR techniques, validated techniques, as another possibility of early diagnosis of congenital infection together with the micro method, which is the current parasitological diagnosis, um, with the with the expectation of, of increasing sensitivity during the first months of life of a child because if the, the infection is not detected within the first months of months of life the the diagnosis relies on the serology analysis only after nine months of life of the child however the real-time PCR-based diagnosis of congenital infection is not feasible in research-limited health centers or in peripheral laboratories, mostly of them located at endemic areas. So it is very important to set up point-of-care methodologies and generate evidence to facilitate the access to sensitive diagnosis and rapid point-of-care detection of infected newborns, neonates, and infants. And for that, the loop-mediated isothermal amplification strategy, also called LAMP, is a promising tool to fill in this gap because it can be performed at very simple laboratories. There are a few developed prototype kits for LAMP. One of them um, we have been evaluated is the, the LAMP method developed by the Japanese company Aiken Chemical Company, which reagents are located right into the cap of the microtubes. And then after 40 minutes of incubation at 65 degrees in a heater, you can see by ultraviolet illumination, the results, negative findings or positive findings, but calcine mediated fluorescence. There are other ways to visualize the results of LAMP, such as this one by, by the naked eye. Here you have a negative and here you have a positive finding. Or using very cheap fluorescence boxes with different LED lights. Up to now, there are a few published papers about LAMP and most of them have used highly purified DNA from panels of clinical samples from acute congenital, oral infected, or patients with child disease reactivation, and some in chronic, chronic child disease patients. But these 
DNA purification methods are not feasible for point of care applications. In this context, we have been working in two different field studies trying to apply rapid DNA extraction methods coupled with LAMP for point of care diagnosis of congenital child disease. One of them, the first one, was a pilot field study carried out in peripheral hospitals of Villa Montes and Jacuiba localities in the Gran Chaco in Bolivia, financed by Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo, and all the in, in the context of a consortium conformed by different institutions in Latin America and Spain. And the the aims of, of this study was to compare the LAMP as an index text with the qPCR as a comparator test, and of course, with the current algorithm of congenital tragal disease diagnosis at time of delivery from umbilical cord blood or around two months of life of the child, and to find out the sensitivity and specificity of the LAMP assay in comparison with the current algorithm of diagnosis. Um, and for this study, we have used a three-dimensional printer repurposed as semi-automatic DNA extract extractor coupled to LAMP. We have um, written a standard operative procedure and the DNA extraction method takes about 45 minutes and then after other 40 minutes of incubation of the DNA in, in a water bath, you have the, re, the result. And the preliminary findings in the first 25 patients were very promising because the printer lab, uh, coupled with LAMP method, it was more sensitive than the micro method, and even with than qPCR, and it was able to detect all congenital child disease patients um, diagnosed by the conventional algorithm. The other study which has been done now, uh, it incorporates the LAMP assay to nine hospitals, two in Paraguay, five sites in Bolivia and two in Argentina, and, and is financed by the Global Health Innovative Technology Fund from Japan and Fundación Mundo Sano. And the design is similar. These are the the institutions that conform the consortium. And these are the sites where we are traveling to transfer the, the technique with the supervision of, of the, the staff by Aiken Chemical Company. We have also written a standard operative procedure and only takes 30 microliters of blood or capillary blood from the baby. And it can be done with fluid blood or with dry blood spots in FTA cards. And the extraction lasts around 10 minutes. And after 40 minutes of lamp amplification, you have the, the result. And this uh, SOP includes a procedure for ultra rapid extraction also developed by AK Chemical Company. This is an example of the training in Santiago del Estero, a endemic a zone in a, in a laboratory at the hospital. And now we are working also with, um, with the support of the PAHO uh, in the analytical and field validation of these methods using dried blood spots. You can use about 100 microliters of blood and take part of the filter paper to perform the LAMP. And we have a good analytical sensitivity about 10 parasites or 15 parasites per ml of blood. And we have also tested this in different strains of T. cruzi. And we are transferring this technique to the nine hospitals I have previously mentioned for the other project and to two hospitals in Argentina too. So the perspective for this, these projects is that t uh, will render a highly sensitive and specific rapid diagnosis of congenital child disease 
in peripheral laboratories uh, involving only low volumes of sample of blood sample liquid sample of dry blood spots and hopefully at a lower cost and with shorter turnaround time uh, of manipulation than qpcr thank you very much <coughs> Thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Dr. Sheeman. Um, if you're able to see the chat, Dr. Sheeman, note that there is a question for you. And again, I encourage the audience to use our chat function uh, to continue to ask questions. Um, I will now um, hand over to uh, Luis Gerardo to introduce our fourth speaker. Thank you again, Eva. And our fourth uh, speaker is no stranger for the great majority of us here. He is the executive uh, director of Mundo Sano, and his name is Marcelo Abril. He has worked at the foundation for more than 16 years, and uh, he holds managerial and leadership positions in which he has promoted a multidisciplinary approach uh, to understand and address neglected tropical diseases. His work has fostered uh, a broader view of the design of healthcare models. Uh, by coupling scientific and, and medical tools with insights into the social phenomena and culture. Uh, he is a member of the International Alliance, such as the United uh, to Combat Entities, the Chagas Coalition, and others. And he has also been uh, a member of the Advisory Council of the National Institute of, uh, of Tropical Medicine since 2012. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Marcelo's uh, talk. First of all, I want to thank the organizers of the current ED for once again providing this space to talk about Chagas disease. The objective of my presentation is to tell you in a few minutes the point of view of Mundo Sano on the elements that must be taken into account and address it to advance on the path towards the control of mother to child transmission of Chagas. I will do it based on the work that Mundo Sano carries out always with an attitude of continuous reflection to achieve the best results according not only to our own experiences, otherwise taking into account the work that other institutions and groups does and considering the progress and changes in the situation and context of Chagas disease in general and its mother to child transmission in particular. It is necessary to have a broad and comprehensive view of all the factors involved to address Chagas disease. The cultural aspects of the people and groups affected must be included, as well as the material and human resources available in each region. And we must think about the level of training of these human resources and the possible need to train them. A very important point is to consider at all times that the challenge we face requires increasing the demand of the affected people in a delicate balance of increasing the health system's capability to attend them. At Mundo Sano, we work on different dimensions of Chagas disease. We promote its diagnosis and treatment. We are committed with ensuring the availability of metidazole for its treatment. We also make efforts in research and we give it a very important value to the advocacy work. It is important to say that all our projects and activities are aligned with the goals of the WHO entities roadmap and that our pilots are aligned with the PAHO EMTCT plus strategy. In the Chaco region, in the area of the triple border of Argentina, Bolivia and Paraguay, we develop an intervention model strengthening local healthcare skills through intensive, specialized and periodic actions every 60 days. This is a project that we do together at the SAR, other Argentinian organizations specialized in primary healthcare. We promote diagnosis and treatment for newborns, as well as postpartum follow-ups to mothers using high standard medical practices. At the same time, we carry out the family approach, which includes the evaluation of other children of the infected mothers, increasing the scope of the actions to the whole family group. We must emphasize that the attention, and especially the follow-up that we do in this really difficult scenario, which is a rural area with dispersed population conformed by different local ethnic groups is much higher than what is carried out in many towns and cities, both 
medium and large. At the same time, we also work to strengthen central maternity services and primary care centers, recruiting mothers at risk of Chagas disease and fostering follow-ups of newborns and mothers. In this model, we take advantage of pre-existing capacities and create referral channels between centers of higher complexity and those of primary care. We are currently carrying out this work linked to a research project. The project field validation of Trypanosoma cruzi lamp, a molecular point of care test for the control of congenital Chagas disease, is a regional initiative implemented in Argentina, Bolivia and Paraguay. This project is co-financed by the Shihid Fund of Japan and the Munosano Foundation. The project is carried out by the consortium led by East Global, with the participation of CEADES from Bolivia, CEDIC from Paraguay, the Ingevi Institute of Conicet from Argentina, as well as the Aiken Company from Japan. Its main objective is to produce scientific evidence to propose possible changes in the diagnostic algorithm for congenital Chagas disease, offering an easier way to do the diagnosis of the newborns. LAMP technology does it require no much equipment and is more independent of the presence of specialized operators respect to the traditional techniques, in fact, one of the barriers to defeat. To think about achieving control of the mother-to-child transmission of child disease, it is a necessary condition to have the availability of drugs for its etiological treatment. In this aspect, our commitment, together with the LEA laboratory and in Sud Pharma, is firm. Since 2012, we guarantee the constant production of metidazole. We want to mention that currently, we have an open offer of pediatric metidazole donation to all the countries of the Americas. Give visibility to Chagas disease. Spread good news. Spread positive experiences. Let people know what their rights are and that they can and should ask for their attention. All of this includes advocacy work. And in this field, we are proud to have launched in 2019 the campaign Not a Single Baby with Chagas, and that in 2021, this proposal has become an initiative approved by the member states of the Ibero-American General Secretary under the name Not a Single Baby with Chagas, the path towards new generations free of Chagas disease. Thanks for your attention. Very well, thank you very much to you, Marcelo, and for the great work you've been uh, developing uh, through these various initiatives, because we know uh, your, uh, your effort, personal effort in the uh, effort of Fundación Mundo Sano has been key for uh, uh, encouraging all of these uh, great advances throughout the many projects that you have in Latin America. So Eva, I think we're, we're, um, um, we have concluded our four topics uh, initial, and, and now we have uh, a new uh, section in, in uh, uh, coming for, for a couple of questions. Uh, not sure if you want to open up for one or two comments now, or if we should just jump into the, the four uh, topics, questions that we have uh, upcoming. What do you think? I, I think for time's sake, it would be good for us to jump into the discussion. Um, however, again, we would like to encourage the audience to please both send uh, questions for the, the speakers you just heard to the chat. Um, and then for the discussions, uh, we're gonna try to get through as many of our discussion topics as possible. Okay, so why don't we le uh, invite uh, our first um, um, uh, professional uh, and colleague to make a, a short comment, I would say a, a very uh, insightful comment on, on topic number one, how improving diagnosis can strengthen health systems. And I will also encourage uh, our colleague to introduce uh, himself. Is that uh, Julio Alonso is, can, can be Julio, open the Julio mic. Yeah. 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 Just a short uh, introduction of yourself, please, Julio, and, and uh, an insightful comment on the topic. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Castellanos. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think my connection is unstable, but um, yeah, briefly, my name is uh, Julio Alonso Padilla. I work at Is Global, where I am an assistant research professor at the Chagas Disease Laboratory, which I run, and I'm also, uh, since uh, recently, also co-director of the Chagas Disease Initiative. Um, thank you very much for this uh, chance to lead the discussion. It's been very nice to see the presentations by uh, the fourth uh, uh, researchers. Um, going to the point to fit the, the, the discussion, my question to the audience would be related to um, the use of uh, rapid tests, because uh, evidences are accumulating in the literature. It's true that the there might be limitations to the widespread use of RDTs, but uh, there are uh, more and more articles uh, that show that they work, they, they have a performance which is similar to conventional tools. And uh, the question would be, uh, what do you think whether it would be possible to um, rely on rapid tests, on a combined use of rapid tests, or even at some point, given they work very nicely, use of a single rapid test for the uh, detection of chronic Chagas disease. Uh, for example, in regions of uh, Bolivia and Argentina, the, the studies show that the, they perform uh, very similar to the ELISAs. Um, that would be it. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Julio. And um... I think there's plenty to to talk about rapid testing. We as PAHO uh, encourage uh, the the great news of upcoming new uh, rapid tests as we have used them in other diseases. Uh, can think of malaria, who uh, at the very beginning never used and then was introduced in the Americas. But I also think that there is a great challenge in terms of the sensitivity and specificity and particularly the use of those rapid tests in different countries, in different environments, and even documentation of using the same rapid tests in the same geographic locations with different performances at different times. So I think there is still a lot to do. Great news, there is companies and scientists like yourself put a lot of effort into the improving of, the, of this uh, uh, construction of rapid tests, and I hope we will soon have better better uh, access to them. Um, Eva, microphone is yours. Um, also, just a brief comment on this topic. Um, speaking from North America, of course, um, where we have a small amount of a conthernus transmission, um, but also imported cases of Chagas disease, we have also been very slow uh, to implement rapid tests. And this is an area that we're very interested in working um, diligently on as well, for the same reasons um, that Julio Padilla um, and Luis Gerardo mentioned. Um, unfortunately, we only have one test that's FDA approved, um, but hopefully for us um, and for the rest of the Americas and um, Spain, et cetera, uh, more tests are going to be officially approved by uh, governing bodies in the next couple of years. Now, um, we still have uh, three minutes uh, for our first topic. And so uh, I definitely want to encourage questions from the uh, participants in the audience. Um, I'm also looking at the chat because I'd like to encourage everybody to enter their comments in the chat. Um, if you would like to speak, um, please use the raise your hand icon in the reactions portion of Zoom. Um, I am having a little bit of trouble seeing everybody. And so if um, my co-moderators could help me Okay, I yeah. do see a comment. I do Anybody, see a any, it, in the chat yeah. uh, from Andrea Marchiol. Um, she says, I believe that the use of rapid tests for Chagas could strengthen the system. Reference laboratories are interested in validating the tests and seeing how they work in their context. 
In addition, there is an increasing use of rapid diagnostic tests for other infectious diseases. It is necessary to increase the regional evidence that can change the current algorithms. Um, thank you, and Andrea, I completely agree with that comment. Absolutely. Um, I uh, see, uh, Javier, you have raised your hand. Uh, please uh, speak. Yeah, just in case uh, there is nobody else from the complete ignorance on diagnosis methodologies. And uh, uh, también quiero uh, motivar a la gente que, que hable solo español. También lo puede hacer y hacemos una traducción lo más rápida posible. So, um, y puede levantar su mano para, para hablar en cualquier momento. So, just my question is... Um, um, looking at what I have seen in the field, that is a limited experience in, 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 in looking at how in the field in rural and remote areas has been, has been doing with a diagnosis test. Um, I would like to ask to the experts, I mean, Julio, even Luis Gerardo and, and you, Evan and, and, and Alejandro, um, what is the horizon that we can expect for Chagas disease in the next five to eight years? Um, we will see a combination of traditional methods of uh, diagnosis in those areas where there is lab capacity with rapid diagnosis tests in remote areas or rapid diagnosis tests, as I have perceived in the presentation of Alejandro, uh, the, the wonderful results of the LAMP methodology could be an alternative for any kind of landscape and settings. I don't know if you understood my, my Maybe my we question. can offer the, 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 the microphone to Julio, but uh, I think uh, if I your please. microphone is open, Julio, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Javier. Yeah, I think what you say is uh, very reasonable. Uh, like um, in the William, sorry, we cannot hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was saying uh, thank you, Javier, for uh, what you mentioned is very reasonable. Uh, surely, in the forthcoming years, well, luckily there will be a combination of uh, currently used methodologies, which uh, they provide very, very good sensitive and very good specific specificity. Uh, the issue is that. Um, in many uh, rural laboratories or away from uh, uh, urban areas, and even in, in, in urban areas, um, the advantages that RD, that RDTs can provide are, are uh, remarkable. Uh, think, for example, um, and uh, two of the presenters, uh, Dr. Alejandro Schickman and uh, Marcelo Abril, they talked about the Chagas lamp use uh, for the detection of uh, babies born to seropositive mothers. And in that study, even in urban uh, areas, we are seeing that uh, in some cases it's uh, not possible to have a diagnosis, an immediate diagnosis of the mothers. And if we rely in uh, conventional tools, it takes several days to get the uh, turnaround of results. And uh, we risk that the mothers uh, leave uh, the hospital because they have other children, they, they have responsibilities, they, they have to uh, go back to work. And it's not possible to, to reach to that potentially infected uh, baby. So uh, at that, in, in that context, for example, RDTs are also uh, incredibly useful because they give you a, a rapid uh, diagnosis of the mother. And then uh, the algorithm to uh, detect uh, the babies can be started. So that, that would be another scenario where RDTs uh, can be extremely, extremely useful. And, uh, that was, that was it. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Julio. And um, Alejandro, did you have a comment? I see that your microphone is unmuted. I have written a, a response to a person in, in the chat about the, the cost effective use of, of LAMP. Um, it's before Abdera Marchol, but I, I think it's important to I think in the next years, it will be important to increase the speed of the regulation agency <coughs> to allow the, the authorization to commercialize all these, all these methods once they are valid, validated in, in the field. 
Yeah, certainly agree with that. Um, okay, so thank you all for speaking to that discussion topic. Um, we need we our time is very limited, and so we must move on to our second uh, topic. Um, which will be a discussion of the ethical aspects of the approach in diagnosing and treating mothers and newborns for chronic patients. Prevention of transmission does not mean cure. Um, and to start off the discussion of this topic, I'm going to hand it back over um, to Luis Gerardo. <laughs> so Javier is always putting on me the pressure of uh, opening up this um sensitive sensitive issue and and i have to agree with the great majority of uh, well my name is luis castellanos and i work for the pan-american health organization i am responsible for overseeing the implementation of prevention and control and elimination programs in pajo for vector-borne diseases and um and, and neglected infectious diseases so um, when it comes to the ethical considerations, I believe that there is no question in terms of the usefulness and the mandate from public health point of view to address uh, the issue of mother to, to child transmission of Chagas disease. And overall, having access to diagnosis and treatment is mandatory for us. Uh, my concern starts when we address the issue of treating uh, uh, women in uh, reproductive age to interrupt transmission to um, uh, the, uh, mother to child of Chagas disease. The benefit, the benefit of doing that for kids, it's invaluable. It's it's unquestionable. But the fact that many of the infected females, mothers, uh, uh, Female, women in reproductive age or pregnant women may be detected in an advanced stage of disease. They will have to be counseled and informed so they can make a constant decision of having their babies treated and having themselves treated so they can prevent further transmission in, 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 a, in an upcoming pregnancy. But it is also as well as important to let uh, have clarity that not every single uh, women offered treatment will be cured. And that is very important for every single patient to understand. You find a 30 year old, a 28 year old female that is thinking on having a pregnancy and she lives in an endemic area because there is vector and there's vector board transmission. Uh, this, uh, this female, if treated, can easily interrupt transmission to a child. But by herself, she needs to understand what are the consequences of herself receiving treatment. And if, because she has received treatment, she is cured of disease. That's, that's the, the, the overall environment that I, that I have been uh, passing on to. Because uh, I, I think that just concentrating on the babies kind of leaves the human part of the mothers uh, or, or the of the women in reproductive age aside they're not containers they're human beings and they deserve the right to be informed and counseled because some of them may just progress with their disease over time and there is very little to do about it so i think the addressing of a public health initiative to interrupt mother to child to child transmission is even embedded within PAHO through the EMTCT Plus initiative. But the need of counseling uh, women in reproductive age is mandatory because not every single person will react uh, the same way. Some uh, women may may be disappointed or depressed or angry when they are told they may not be cured. And that needs to be addressed. Uh, the understanding that their babies will be protected and no further transmission will be avoided, that's great. But it's an important, uh, uh, very important part of this process to understand how ethically, uh, the ethical consequences of properly counseling uh, females. That that's what I wanted to bring onto the table, and I'll stop there, Eva. <clears throat> yeah. thank you, Luis Gerardo. And I think your point brings up a, a 
another very important point about strengthening prenatal care infrastructure in endemic countries and training of um, obstetras um, OBGYNs as well about Chagas disease uh, because they are on the front line of women who need to be screened uh, prior to pregnancy. Yeah, and 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 of course, I mean, uh, as as you may have heard in the past, um, and we'll open for for other questions. But we heard uh, Jeffrey speaking of, on the CMIA, and we have heard uh, uh, the the usefulness and the benefits of rapid test on point, as a point of care, and even lamp new techniques but one thing is to prove that those um, new tools work the efficiency and effectiveness of them in a completely different environment is to scale up the use of those tools in public health environments particularly in poor public health environments so maybe we could um, open up for one or two comments or question? Yes, certainly. Um, and just as another reminder to the audience, um, please use the raise your hand function if, if you would like to speak. We also encourage you to um, open your video so we can see you as well. I think uh, Julie Jacobson uh, raised her hand. Good morning from the West Coast of the United States. Um, very interesting session and very exciting to see the progress and, the, and to follow the great work that's going on in this area. I just wanted to highlight the in this topic here that the, it really brings to the forefront the fact that it's really important for us to work across the health system and to break the silos between parasitic and neglected tropical diseases into people who provide sexual and reproductive health services in countries. And this is not an easy task and it's something we have to do very intentionally. Uh, and it's not just for Chagas, there's female genital schistosomiasis, there's leishmaniasis, that all these tropical diseases that are very uniquely affecting women and their reproductive health track and, uh, and the babies. Uh, and doing that in a, I think if we work together across these areas, we can strengthen that response in saying that it's very important to consider the very specific environments that these women come from that may be regionally specific, but uh, important uh, to think about them in a holistic way in the environment in which they live. Uh, so that's just my comment. Thank you thank for you. bringing up this. And thank you, Julie, for reminding us of the importance of cross uh, collaboration between uh, health services. The EMTCT Plus initiative has aimed at doing precisely that because it started with HIV and syphilis. So uh, the health services uh, for reproductive, uh, um, for, for women in reproductive health, for sexually transmitted infections, for pregnancy, um, uh, for prenatal controls, and just for other diseases have been uh, improving the way they communicate to, uh, to, let's say, to uh, cover the, the needs of uh, uh, women uh, uh, demanding uh, prenatal services. And, and it is a huge task and it is a great challenge uh, to overcome the many constraints that we have in, in uh, poor health systems in Latin America. But I think it's, it's a key element that we need to, to keep in mind. Uh, so Eva, uh, Maria Jesus Piñazo has also raised her hand. Do, do we still have time? Yes, I, I think uh, Maria Jesus, please speak and you'll be our last question for this discussion or last comment, I guess, for this discussion topic. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. It is, I think that it is one of the most important topics we are dealing with at that moment in, in the context of not only of on Chagas disease, but on Chagas disease, uh, in order to, to promote the control that, as you know, it, it was one of the prioritizations of, of Bajo WHO uh, towards the, the, the control of the full disease, the, to control this mother-to-child transmission. But my question, Luis Gerardo, I think that we have been discussing in, in, several, in several forums on that, is to which point we, 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 we must or we should ex extend this uh, these uh, approaches to women at fertile age because they are going to be the, the ones that are going to be pregnant in, in the future uh, uh, sooner or, or, or later. So, so 
what we can do, what we can learn. Maybe we can think uh, how other neglected tropical diseases or maybe how other programs ha has approached to this and uh, following the comment of, of, of Julie's, uh, uh, Julie's comment, uh, how, we can, how we can feed programs in order to, to achieve the, this goal and to extend the, the, this, uh, this uh, approach to, to, to define better uh, who are the, the women that are at risk of, of having the disease to, disease, to, to identify them to treat if possible before the, the pregnancy and, and that way, as, as we know uh, for, for recent publications, to avoid the transmission in, in their babies. So that was my comment. Thank you. Uh, let me, let me Luis Gerardo, before you're answering, let me uh, add to this question something that I think it is related from a, uh, a comment in the chat from Vil Wilma, uh, working for 20 years in Bolivia, she mentioned, um, she said that in the in the chat that um, according to her experience in Bolivia, for instance, there, there was a law to promote the diagnosis, but not the the, the, the trainings needed to expand that uh, that initiative. And many people has been lost, many children, many women who were not diagnosed. And she, for instance, suggests, if I understand well. Um, to include and to take advantage of uh, maternal care, like for instance, when uh, the offering in the maternal clinic, in the maternal clinics or in the maternal consultations, uh, the offering of the of the vaccine for the virus. Uh, I, I know in Spanish, but it is papilloma uh, yeah. vaccine. So that that would be an opportunity. So that that her comment. Thank you. I think there's plenty of opportunities. And, and as I said, we as PAHO are fully uh, on board on doing, if uh, if optional, um, universal screening. But my, my comment really, it's, it's just take for instance that uh, women in reproductive age may range from 14 to 40 in, in some countries, even, you know, plus or minus uh, but so if you do uh, a good screening program in school age uh, children female children you may find a high number of positives that may be still be treated and cured because they're they're young we may, the progression of disease may not be there so school uh, environments may be a good focus for for better screening in in latin american countries but and and then uh, as as Maria uh, Jesus was referring, I think every country needs to think what is it that we are going to offer to every single adult patient that we find to be positive, considering the progression of disease. As for the babies, the benef the benefit is total, is complete. But as for them, as mothers or young females who never knew they were infected, what is it that the system is going to offer to them? That's the question that I think is important. Counseling services must be there for them to help them. Uh, medical system of referral and counter-referral and, and counter must be there for them to be follow-up and offer them the best possible uh, medical services in the system. Once the systems have figured that, then we can continue uh, even in, in full mode, promoting universal screening for everyone. That, it, it also, that also expands to the, the general population. I mean, we're trying to find the 30% that has affections of cardiovascular uh, systems, but we have a 70% that may even die never knowing they were infected with Chagas. So by by finding this 30% who needs help, we're detecting the 70% who may live their lives not knowing they were infected. Once you tell an asymptomatic adult person with chronic disease that is infected, you must do something for that person. Otherwise, his mental health may be affected. What is it that the system is willing to do with this person? That's, that's the concern we, we carry within PAHO. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody for uh, your comments. Um, that was a wonderful discussion. Um, in interest of time and a desire to at least make it to our third discussion topic, um, very quickly, I'm going to mention our third topic, 
Um, unfortunately, it looks like we will not make it to our fourth. Yeah. Um, however, right now, let's concentrate on our third, which is a uh, discussion of the process of systematic and continuous training on diagnosis and other aspects of Chagas disease in medical schools and health systems, which we have already touched on um, a little bit. And for this topic, I would like to invite um, Carolyn DeMock uh, to give herself a brief introduction and comment upon this topic, please. Thank you, Eva. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to be here and, and contribute to this important discussion. I'm uh, the Global Medical Affairs Director for the Chagas program at Novartis Global Health. And uh, related to the topic, so it's interesting to start uh, sharing with all the group what we have been discussing in the working group at the Chagas Coalition that is focused on medical education. So first, thinking on the medical and nursing in schools, what we, we know is that uh, when the healthcare professional is recently graduated from the university, they are not ready to diagnose and treat Chagas disease. No, as uh, in general, the schools does not have a well-structured training on Chagas disease no, in a general way. And thinking on continuing education, uh, we also did some mapping of the currently available trainings on Chagas, the public available that uh, someone could find when searching, uh, doing an online searching. So the team did an online searching and also a survey to the Chagas Coalition members. And uh, what we saw is that although there are some good initiatives out there, there is still a need of a comprehensive uh, and structured educational program, personalized targeting, as some examples that we heard here, and which approach all the aspects of the disease, from prevention, diagnosis and treatment of the infection, but also the management of the clinical forms of chronic chagas, and um, the courses with a clear goals, with some degree of interaction, so the, the healthcare prof, uh, professional can clarify the doubts. And uh, especially when we talk about diagnosis, it is very important to have an easy available training targeting health professionals in primary care. So uh, with this, some questions that we'd like to bring to the group for discussion is uh, what kind of challenge that you see related to medical education in, in Chagas? And what could be done to implement an effective continuous training target uh, to healthcare professionals to improve, to really improve and have the impact on uh, improving the diagnosis and treatment? Thank you so much, Carolyn, for introducing that discussion topic. Um, please, everybody, um, if you could raise your hand, uh, if you would like to comment. Um, while waiting for people to comment, um, I will comment myself um, that, of course, yeah. in countries that are not traditionally endemic for Chagas, uh, such as the United States, and I'm sure it's similar in Spain, um, there is virtually no education uh, about Chagas disease for healthcare professionals, uh, including physicians, nurses, physician assistants, etc., um, and this is a, an issue that we are trying to actively improve, especially as we are noting more cases uh, in the southern United States. But, but Eva, I can tell you that uh, in my case, and in, as we have uh, over, over the years been able to document, medical schools in Latin America do not spend more than an hour or an hour classroom uh, teaching tropical diseases to medical students. So how much can you grasp of a, a, a two couple of dozens of tropical uh, diseases in, in, in an endemic country? So as soon as you move back to rural areas in which we are mandated to do on the sixth year of training, either dengue or leishmaniasis or Chagas, you're confronted with reality. You just don't know what to do. Let me add, just as, as the external moderator, let's say. So okay. I invite uh, everybody to open the, their cameras to show their coffees or whatever <laughs> they are doing at this moment, if it is publicable. And, and, raise, um, their and raise their hand to comment. 
And but just a single comment on that. Um, this this topic, I think it's it's transversal. In it touches uh, all the topics. In fact, it touches the, the need of training for better diagnosis performance. But it it also touches the ethical aspects that you mentioned before, Luis Gerardo. And uh, just to refer that yesterday, I received a telephone call from one of the user of our consultation page that we have in the Chagas Coalition. And uh, normally users ask us uh, to what institution or to what specialized uh, can be referred depending on their, on their contents. And we try to help to find the, the closer uh, people that can provide uh, healthcare. And this was a, a woman from North Carolina, uh, from uh, Mexico, and that uh, was uh, diagnosed by Chagas disease uh, because of a heart failure. And, um, and when she was referred to the infectious, infectious disease specialist, um, the doctor that attend to her tell her that the, there is no solution for her and that's that's no no solution for her so th those kind of messages uh, uh, the consequence of that was an attack of anxiety and the woman was uh, needed to be transferred to the hospital to the urgent uh, war of the hospital because of the anxiety because uh, she understood the message in a way that was uh, absolutely not correct so not only the ethical aspect of the of the of the training, but also uh, the way the communication between doctors and patients in this kind of disease so difficult to to express. Even uh, it is difficult to express if the people is cure or not. No, but uh, even more, it's we have we all have a responsibility, especially the experts on Chagas disease has now the responsibility to transfer their knowledge. To the new generations to come and that's the way in which we can provide support through all the institutions uh, at, at country level but also in international level to transfer those knowledge in order to improve the training on Chagas disease in the schools medicines in the nursing medicines and and in the whole community so I think we, we need to reflect and to think on that I think yeah Thank you, Javier. Uh, and uh, before I pass the, the word to, uh, let's just to expand, I think we should offer uh, a couple of minutes uh, uh, to uh, Maria Jesus. But let's first hear from Claudia Herrera, who just uh, raised her hand. Uh, sorry, can you, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Um, I just have, uh, yes, following the, 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 the comment from, from Javier, is if we have, we are trying, we, we are doing these, these programs uh, to educate the, the health cares here in the United States and in Louisiana. What happened when we have this, you no, know, we are now the patient and the, and the healthcare facility uh, provider in good shape, I mean, to, to start the, the, uh, the, the treatment but we have not the access to the treatment. So, so, so how we can uh, make that connection between the treatment of the, the, the people, of the pharmacists, of the, in this case here in, in the United States, how we can do this link uh, with, uh, and also with the governments. I mean, in, in, in usually I, I call the, to, to, to the Department of Health and they also are like, a, we don't know exactly, what, sh what we should do in this, in this case. So we have all these people well-trained, but what is the next step? Thank you, Claudia. I just wanted to, uh, uh, maybe I should offer the, the word to Eva, but uh, to, to remind everyone that the situation in, in the United States is completely different from the situation in Latin America. In Latin America, every single country should offer the treatment for free. And everyone knows that the public health system holds treatment and through WHO and some donors, we provide for free distribution of both medications on yearly basis without any limitation to the amount of treatments every country may need on yearly basis. So let's stop there and offer the and, word. Maria. And Luis, uh, uh, let me sorry, just Eva. briefly say, um, while you know many more people in South America and Central America for that matter with Chagas disease, just to comment for Claudia, 
in the United States, benzonidazole should be available through Excelsis to um, everybody through their website. Um, and I can share that website address. Um, but Maria Jesus, please comment. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. Thank you very much. It, it was not a super important comment, but just to remind that uh, in, in Latin America, there are many, many health problems. Chagas is one more problem. And uh, this is an elected tropical disease. So as important as train uh, healthcare personnel is to raise awareness on, on what Chagas disease means for the health of the people that in a country like, for example, Bolivia, uh, has uh, around 10% of, of prevalence uh, of, of the disease and the variant that that's, that's supposed. So it is important to train, but uh, at the same time, it is important to raise awareness. And that was my, my comment. Well, Eva, I, I think we're running out of time. So I'll let you use the microphone for your last minute and maybe we can offer a, a last minute uh, 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 of time to Javier too. Please go ahead. Yes, um, I just, I want to thank everybody for attending this session. Um, I also, uh, somebody who has not had a shout out yet uh, and who deserves one for a lot of hard work and dedication, probably more than anybody to put this session together, is Javier Sancho. And so please, uh, Javier, we want to give the very last minute to you. <laughs> Go ahead. No, very, very quickly, because we are going to be cut in, in, in a second <laughs> in order to go to the other sessions and to the plenary. Thank you for the organizers, to the organizers. Thank you for everybody who sent their comments and, and all their thoughts. They, they can continue send us their comments and response to the topics. Sorry to Maria Flores that was prepared there to intervene and to open the discussion in the fourth topic. But please uh, send us your, your thoughts on that. And we will have another opportunity for, to, to discuss on that, I promise. Thank to the moderators, Luis Gerardo and Eva. You did a wonderful, challenging job, not only because of your call, and, <laughs> and, but also because of the time that we had. And we ask Cora and TD organizers to give us more time, please, next time, because this is going to be on fire in the next minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending this session. Thank Bye -bye. you.